Hello and welcome to Best Take. Best Take is a showcase of student film and video produced by students at Maricopa Community Colleges. I'm Kyle Watkins. And I'm Matt Burkett. Today's show features the TV studio production class at Scottsdale Community College, where students learn how to create a TV show. They learn camera operation, directing, sound design, graphics, set construction. Yeah, and they start with a simple talk show. Today, we'll screen an episode of Artist Spotlight, where local comedian Gene Moore is interviewed about his craft. Let's take a look. Hello, and welcome to Artist Spotlight. I'm your host, Deanne Kincaid. Today's guest is comedian Gene Moore. Welcome to the show, Gene. Thank you, Deanne. It's good to I, be here. I understand you are a stand-up comedian. How yeah. long have you been standing up? <laughs> <laughs> For seven long, seven really long years, really. Well, is, is seven years a long time? No, in the scheme of things, it takes a long time just to get good. Like, everyone's just trying to get good. It takes a long time, but I thought, I thought I was funny. I thought I would have this nailed down in like two years at tops, but it's, it's two a Two years, that's still pretty long. <laughs> it's long, it's long, yeah, yeah. So how did you get started? Did you just uh, dream up material and go on stage or well, did you do an online course or no, something? No, 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 I wish I could do <laughs> online courses. So, yeah. No, you know what it was? I always have been the funny person. I come from a very funny family. Everybody in my family yeah. is funny. Like if there's a funeral or a wedding, you want them to sit next to you. We just, we're just funny people. And we're broken, but we're funny. So uh, I always wanted to do stand-up comedy, but I didn't, I didn't have any confidence. And so I kind of forced myself to do it. And I uh, kind of I went to a comedy club out of town because I felt like if I failed, nobody would see it. Nobody would be the wiser. But as I was sitting in the audience, I kind of figured out there was a design. There was a way to do this. And so... I left that show a little deflated, <laughs> a little uh, bruised, uh, but I went in and rolled myself into a club and stayed for four years learning how to write, learning the technique, how to stand, how to ask for shows, how to learn and navigate the politics of comedy. And I, I think that training has really helped build a strong foundation for me. I talk to a lot of new people who start comedy who don't see the value in education. And I, I think it's insane. I think it's crazy to get in front of people and not have the tools that you need to succeed. It's crazy. So comedy is education for you? It is education. It is doing it. It is studying it. It is repeating it. It is, it is, it is trying to figure out how it works. And is there a structure to it? There is a structure to comedy. There is also a structure of how you work in comedy. Mm. There's also a structure of your energy. There's structure to everything. It's it a seems, it, you know, when the performers are on stage, it seems like they're just doing it off the top of their head. Yeah. Is it off the cuff or is it rehearsed? Sometimes. sometimes. I'll tell you this. Like when I first started, I used to focus and I used to obsess about every word and parcel it and try to get every cadence down. But then I kind of realized, oh, oh, it, and this is what it comes to. Really, you're writing a script for a character that's on stage. You're doing a play every night. It's right. a performance. <laughs> right. So you're writing that script yeah. for that actor to do that performance. And sometimes you're in the moment, and sometimes you're pulling things back from the archives, and sometimes <laughs> it's you're making it up right there on the spot. So it's a mixture of written, rehearsed, and improv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah now, yeah. you talked about words. Tell me what you feel is the impact of words on the audience. Words. Words are important to me. Um, when I look at comedy, or even when I'm doing anything, I like to be... I always think of it from the audience member. Comedy is a business. People don't get that. It is a business. Yeah. If you understand from the audience what they're hearing, what they're seeing, what they're sensing, um, it helps. So words are critical. Now I'll tell you this, I was very lucky. Um, as a kid, my mother used to read us the Warren Report. What? The Warren Report. It's a crazy thing to read kids. I know we were five and you know we knew but when you think about no. it my uh the warren report was written by lawyers they yes. were older people they were using an older vernacular it's an older language and i know when i was a kid and i would talk to other people they would laugh at my words so i knew at a young age the importance of words and uh -huh. how you could kind of slice them and dice them and make them mm. funny um you know i talked like a supreme i thought that was funny but you know it's, it's you so mean funny. a supreme court supreme <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 but um did they make fun of you using 
legalese or did? No, you know, like I wouldn't say, like if somebody took a, a picture, I wouldn't say picture, I'd say portrait. I would use the formal word because oh. that's all I knew. Oh. But I mean, so you learn words. Now I'll also add this, um, I am gay. And so I wrestle with sometimes using the word faggot. Sometimes it's a strong word. Usually it's offend people that get offended by it are people who don't, aren't even gay. They're the ones that are offended. Go by figure. It. I know. Yeah, they're the ones. I'm that shocked. Are the, yeah, but it's not like I use the word to shock or or to. Whenever I use a word or something, I try to figure out how is this, because I'm constantly editing things. Like, how does this move the story forward? How does this, you know, how does this transcend the human experience? How is this going to help? So I don't use the word just to use it. I use it to try to impact it in a way, in a way to free myself from the insecurity. Mm. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're going to get a chance to see you actually perform stand-up comedy because okay. we have a clip for our viewers. Okay. So we're going to check out that clip right now. Let's take a look and see him perform. sheep in my family. I, uh, I'm that guy that was the last one to know he was gay. Like everybody in my family, everybody in my school, they all knew I was gay. I said to my sister, did they always know I was gay? She's like, bitch, please. I'm like, how, how did they know? She's like, gee, you wore a polo shirt every day to work with a pop collar. I'm like, that'll make you gay. She's like, gee, you wore penny lovers every day to work with no socks. I'm like, that still won't make you gay. She's like, gee, we're migrant workers, that's gay. It is, so it is. Grew up in Michigan, any Michigan people here today? Yes, thank you. When I grew up though, they were uh, kidnapping little kids all the time, and I was always so worried. I, was never, I never wanted to leave the house. So my mom, you know, like to take me to the store or something, she'd put me on like one of those little horses and put a quarter in there, you know, and it'd be rock. That's probably how I turned into a big old fag, you know. But I uh, <laughs> just rock back and forth like that, you know. But then I'd get all crumpled and forget, and she'd go away, and I'm like, Mom, where you going? They're gonna kidnap me. And she's like, no, mijo, no. <laughs> they don't steal the brown ones. <laughs> wow, you have really high energy. And obviously you have command of the stage. You must have had an excellent instructor. <laughs> I did, I have an excellent. Did you? Yeah, it was you. <laughs> it no, was you, yeah. No. The Yankee Kate is, it, is an, it has been an absolute delight. Like, to have you help me structure everything, you know, and I hear your voice in the back of my head sometimes as you kind of guide me through. As I repeated it and repeated it and repeated, repeated it, it. repeated it, yeah. If it doesn't move the story forward, Get it lose out. it. Yeah, yeah, edit, edit, edit. Kill your darlings. Kill yeah. your darlings, oh, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Well, I have to admit, I did have a bit of a hand in creating this monster I see in front of me yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's a wonderful feeling also to see your success. You're tremendously successful. In fact, I understand that you perform about 25 shows a month not a year, a month I now, try. and you work full time, and you have a relationship, and you're healthy. How do you do that? How do you balance all that? <laughs> yeah, you're not like sickly. Yeah, I know I'm not sickly. This is all fake. <laughs> no, it's it's like everything. It's just a facade. No, you know what? I balance everything, and I fail a lot. I used to be really hard on myself. Yeah. Now I just give myself a break. I'm doing the best that I can, I'm, and I wish I knew what I was doing. It would make it so much easier, but I don't. So. Do you mean you just get out there and keep performing and performing and performing? Win or, win or lose, succeed or fail, it's all good It's experience. that and it's more. It's that and it's more. It's, uh, I'm still a human being trying to navigate through this life. Yeah. And so I'm in a relationship and, you know, sometimes I miss birthdays and that's uh -oh. hell. I have to yeah. pay at home. I miss a friend's wedding or I miss funerals. That hurts. You know what I mean? Sometimes you can't be where everybody is. and Because you're committed to performing. You, yeah, you have to do that. And, wow. and, you know, so it's that. And then I go to work and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be, I, whatever I learn, and I learned this from improv, again, the comedy and education is important. Improv is be present and yes and. And yes. so if you're yes and, whatever you say to me, I'm always going to say yes and. I'm going to make it funnier. What that does is it reduces the stress and mm -hmm. it keeps you in the moment. It just lets you focus in on what you got to do. Mm -hmm. You just balance as best as you can. And you just have to accept the fact that somebody's going to be upset. No, nobody's going to always get the perfect performance out of you. Right. And somebody in your family is 
going to see you absent at an important event. Yeah, now let me tell you this, in addition to that, that clip you just showed was yes. in North Carolina. Yeah. I, my, my cousin, who I hadn't seen in a very long time, because when my family found out I was gay, they, ca they kicked me out. It oh. was a difficult, I mean, I get on my feet and I mm -hmm. make it, whatever. What kills me when they kicked me out is my family is the kings. It's an art form to talk crap about people. <laughs> and I wish I was in the room when they were talking crap about me, because I know it was good. But anyways, I was at that show and I saw my cousin <laughs> And uh, mm -hmm. she came and told me she was my cousin, and we reconciled, and they said, you know, uh, you know, you could come back home. After, you know, like 17 years, you could come back home, you know, for the holidays. And so... Um, <laughs> what did you say? I said, yes. You know what I mean? Now, here I am getting closer to Christmas, and I'm thinking, God, I oh, wish this, I could... Oh, this coming Christmas yeah. would be the first time? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So now, as I'm getting closer to it, I'm thinking, you know, I wish I could get cancer. But I got bad <laughs> luck. I got really bad luck because that guy with the Korea, the Korea bomb guy, the crazy yeah, guy, yeah, yeah. he's probably going to bomb us and the radiation is going to cure me and I'm still going to have to go. Uh -oh. So, I mean, that's my luck. But what I'm saying is is that that balance of family, not yeah. having that family, gives me extra time. Yeah. <laughs> And you, don't have to, you don't have to waste your time no, going to yeah, funerals yeah, 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 yeah. And, and weddings yeah. and those and horrible... The money birth that I saved, yeah. not spending, oh, yeah. it's a good oh, yeah. gift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've got a real fire in your belly for all this. I do. It's, it could be fire or some could say it's a flame because I'm a flamer. Oh. I mean, you know, maybe it could be that. Or, you know. <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure to have you on the show. And I know many of our viewers will probably see you around town or in Flagstaff, in Tucson, or in North Carolina. North Carolina. So I want to thank our guest, Gene Moore, for being on the show thank today. You. I'm your host, Deanne Kincaid. Thank you for watching. I understand Gene is the hardest working comic in Phoenix. It's true. He's known to perform in clubs and open mics about 300 times a year. That's crazy. Yeah, it's interesting to hear what goes into the creation of a comedy routine and see how their career affects their personal relationships with friends and family. No, it really is. Now, up next is a conversation with another comedian, Marianne Martini, a very special lady. Let's watch. Our guest today is a very special lady from Arizona, Marianne Holmes, who some of you may recognize as Marianne Martini, a stand-up comedian, writer, producer, designer, sometime actor, and LGBT activist. Aside from her many hats and accomplishments, she's also a proud transgender woman. Welcome, Marianne. Thank you, it's so great to be here. I have to tell our audience that I first met you when you began taking comedy classes from me a few years ago. Marianne has had an amazing life and is well worth sharing. Where would you like to begin? Well, when people meet me the first time, they always ask me the same question. How long have you known you were supposed to be a woman or a girl? Well, I have to admit, it's been 71 years. Wow. So there never was a time in my life that I didn't. When I was growing up, we didn't have terms like transgender or gender dysphoria. Those just came about in the last 25 years or so. So for little boys that acted like girls back in when I was a kid, uh, the expression was, don't worry about it, he'll grow out of it. So obviously that didn't work out so well. So how old were you when you first had these feelings? Well, my oldest memory is in 1949. I was three years old and we lived in California. And one evening I walked into the living room with my sister's dress, coat, purse and hat on and I'd gotten into my mom's lipstick so the lower half of my face was covered in red <laughs> and my parents just stopped and my dad said where are you going and I said I'm going shopping with the ladies and my dad told me not to move <laughs> grab that lamppost and don't move he went and got his good camera and he took a wonderful picture of me and which he framed and wow. that was his favorite picture forever. In fact, as I got older and probably wasn't growing out of it, um, <laughs> my dad would 
bring this picture out every time that I brought a friend home, a boy or even a girlfriend as I got older, and he would say, do you want to see my favorite picture of David? When he was three years old, he thought he was a little girl. So they tried to shame me out of it as I got older, but uh, that didn't work out so well either. I guess not. No. So, so what was it like when you began going to school? Oh my gosh, first day of kindergarten, I was five years old and my teacher, Mrs. Fuller, um, had girls line up over here and boys line up over here. So I walked right over and got in the girls line. As Mrs. Fuller came and grabbed me out of the line and said, no, you're over here. I suddenly realized that five-year-old little boys can be the meanest kids mm -hmm. in the world. And I learned from that point that if you think you're a girl, you better not let anybody know it. So I actually went in the closet when I was five years old. Hmm. And what about your relationships with girls in the class? Did you have girlfriends? Were you attracted to girls? Well, I hung out with the girls because they were who I wanted to be. They had the pretty clothes and they had the doll houses and they mm -hmm. played dress up and their hair and they smelled so much nicer than those <laughs> crummy boys. And um, even though I did play with boys, but I became best friends with most of my girlfriends. Mm -hmm. It was just um, where I wanted to be. So hiding your gender preference, did that become more difficult each passing year? I mean, this had to have been a strain as you approached puberty. Yeah, as you get older, you learn to compensate and to do things to dis disfuse or to change the narrative. You do a lot of things that boys do, but then you secretly still have these feelings and you could express them when you were around your girlfriends because you became one of them. I thought, you're just like us. Um, and I learned to do all the feminine things. I learned to cook, I learned to sew. Um, all these things that my mom, I think, taught me because she might have known. So you formed close relationships with girls. Were the other boys jealous that you were tight with the girls? You know, they were, but they didn't realize that this bond with them as I got older <laughs> created a, uh, just a natural bit of trust. Mm. And while my friends were playing football, <laughs> I was hanging out with their girlfriends and <laughs> having a lot more fun than they were. I'll bet. Yeah, so it was. So it, it's just adjusting and you get so good at it. Mm -hmm. um, you develop a photographic memory. I could go into my sister's drawers or as I got older, my mom's drawers and closet. And if nobody was home, I would put on their clothes and I could put everything back as if it was mm. never been touched. And that's something that I developed over my whole life to protect myself, just hiding. You just don't do anything wrong. Now, there had to have come a point when you realized you were not the only boy who wanted to be a girl. Yeah, that's a day I'll never forget. It was 1959, and my mom and dad on a Saturday night were getting ready to go out, and as I normally did, I watched my mom dress to the nine. She was beautiful. And I said, where are you going? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, we're going to a nightclub show, and it's a woman that used to be a man. Her name is Christine Jorgensen, and she was in the Army, and when she got out of the Army, she went to Sweden, and she had surgery to make her into a woman. I, I'm just... I'm speechless every time I think of that moment. Mm. They can do that. And so from that point on, I learned everything I could about what they called sex changes back then, about Christine Jorgensen. Hard to find research when there isn't much, <laughs> but you really start learning. And I thought, someday there's hope for me. What was her nightclub act? She I was a, did a singer and told jokes. <laughs> Oh, the first transgender yes. stand-up comedian. Yeah, and she I didn't kind of, that. she didn't hide the fact that she was transgender. Oh, she was darn. public out. I mean, she made a lot of money for it. Wow. In the meantime, did you get married and have kids? Or? I did. Back in the 60s, I did everything macho that I could do. I went through high school. I went to college. I got married. I had kids. Um, I had secret closets built into the houses that I built. So when no one was around, I could express myself. And then my first and second wife knew that I had gender issues. And I went to counseling with them. And then I was in therapy. 
and all of the psychiatrists, which we called shrinks back then, uh -huh. all they would do was try and fix you because you were broken. Something was terribly wrong with you. And when I couldn't be fixed, that was part of the reason that both marriages dissolved. But then I also was not a very loyal husband. Um, I actually cheated on both my wives because it was a macho thing to do. It deflected my gender issues. How twisted our thinking was in those days. That's the macho thing to do. So yeah. behind the scenes, you're expressing your femininity and having to do it in secret, and yet you're married with kids as a husband. There had to have been a time when you finally realized that you could live your life as a woman the way you always wanted to. I got married again. 25 years ago um, to a woman that knew two years before we got married that I had gender issues and we didn't know what to do about it back then and then about the time I turned 60 which is 11 years ago um, people started dying friends cousins in one year I lost five people that I felt really loved and dear to and I went to my wife and I said finally I can't live anymore without finding out who I am really and expressing and becoming the woman that I've always wanted to be. And I was so lucky that my wife said, you have my love, you have my support, I want you to be happy. I don't want you to be on your deathbed and say, I yeah. wish I would have. Yeah. But if you do this, you're going to do it the right way, which was you're going to change physically you're going to learn to be act feminine. You're not just going to put on a dress. You're going to lose a lot of weight. I learned how to, to do makeup professionally because wow. cover girl <laughs> could never cover boy. Um, <laughs> I admit I had a little facelift, which made me look about 20 years younger than I am. And that made a big difference because that gave me confidence. And that's how my confidence grew. and. It took me about two years before I really went out in public where I was confident enough where I could just blend in. Was but I'm still learning every day. Um, wh wh where was it the first time you went out in public The as first a woman? time, yeah, I went out was in the 80s, early 80s. I was in San Francisco working, and um, I had that extra suitcase <laughs> that I had hidden in a storage locker before I hit the plane or drove. Um, I checked into the Hyatt Regency because I only went to nice places if I'm going to look like a woman. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go to Motel 6. So I spent hours prepping. I even had a video camera to take my picture because I knew what I saw in the mirror was not what the video camera saw. Mm. So I went out and I ventured out in the streets of San Francisco in Barcadero and scared mm. to death. But mm -hmm. I figured everybody's looking at me but that was the start. When uh, but probably everybody wasn't looking at you. You just felt like that at the time because it was new for you, <sighs> right? So new and it's so scary yeah. because there were towns in the past where if you dressed or concealed your identity, you could get arrested. Well, did anything happen to you that no, day? That no, no. Someone were, said... You got back hey, to the hotel safely. Yeah, <laughs> and I was just shaking. And But that was before I decided to really make the change. But yeah. I got a little bit braver and braver as, as you go along. But you spend most of your life hiding who you are. Well, now here comes the big question. Okay. I want to know when and why you made the decision to become a stand-up comedian. Well, as my confidence grew, I realized that I have a story to tell. Mm -hmm. And I thought the best way to express myself and let people meet somebody like me was to do stand-up comedy. Um, certainly I'm a lot older and so I've got a lot of experiences mm -hmm. that some people haven't had growing up when I did. And the stand-up comics that were transgender that I could see online, they were pretty negative mm -hmm. and pretty raunchy at times. And I thought they weren't putting a really good face. So my first attempt at comedy was I did some writing and some stories about where I lived and in the land of old people, which is where I live. And Let's, I went, be let's be clear about what the land of old people I is. I live in an active adult community over 55. Where? And I, in Sun City West. Okay, there we go. And I thought that was uh, pretty funny anyway. Yeah. So my first attempt on stage was 
in a newcomer drag competition oh. where the producer of that show is a friend of mine and I'm up against 21 year old drag queens. But when the, my show was over, my friend Barbara um, said, where did you learn these stories? Did you write all this? And I said, I did. And she goes, they're great. She goes, and the audience loves you. But if you're serious <laughs> about this, you're going to learn how to write comedy because your stories are way too long. And she said, there's a couple um, comedy classes in town, and I suggest you look them up online and pick one. And we'll and see how serious you and are. And that was here in Phoenix. And that's when I found you. And I'm so glad you did, because I've seen you perform on stage. I've had the pleasure of editing those stories down to tight writing, and you're a big success, and perform all over the valley, I understand. I've been pretty lucky to get on a lot of places, um, even on the East Coast. Yes. I just go introduce myself, and yes. they go, okay, we'll give you a try. But I learned so much about myself mm -hmm. and about life, and the confidence that you put into your students, and what I've learned from you, it just it changed my life for the better. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. And you're also spreading the message to help people have a deeper awareness and empathy for those who are transgender. So you're doing a great service for the rest of the world. A lot of people that don't know anybody like me. Yeah. And when I come on stage, when I start talking, they suddenly realize voice doesn't exactly <laughs> match hair and makeup. <laughs> and what's gratifying for me, not just the laughter, but after every single show that I do, no matter where I am, I thank people for coming. And mm -hmm. Invariably, someone will always say, oh. can I ask you a question? And I say, of course you can. Someone will say, I have a neighbor's daughter that thinks she's supposed to be a boy, or my grandson, or my s nephew, or somebody is gender confused. Mm -hmm. What can I do? And I tell everybody the same thing. Give them a hug. Tell them you love them. And together, we'll find information, because the more you know, the better it is. And where do you find that information? Online, Online. just Google yeah. transgender. Yeah. I give everybody my card if they can't find anything send me an email and I'll send you some links. I'm not going to give anybody advice other than to tell them, tell them they love them and give them a hug. Well, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and sharing this information and people can get more information about transgender issues online. Uh, so thank you, Marianne. And thank you for watching Artist Spotlight. I'd like to thank our guest, Marianne Martini, for sharing her story. I'm your host, Ian Kincaid, and remember, life is better with a good laugh. Wow, that was a really extremely personal story that Marianne shared with us there. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm pretty amazed actually. Yeah, and, and for heaven's sake, she certainly doesn't look 71. No, <laughs> not even. You know, it's extremely inspiring to hear somebody finding the confidence and having the courage to make such a monumental change in life, at really any point in your life, but to be 60 wow. and to do that is incredible. And on top of that, to also have the love and support of your spouse it's incredibly important, but it's also just a really beautiful. I'm just impressed. Yeah, and equally interesting is her journey in finding her comedic voice. This is true. This yeah. is very true. And, and you can find Marianne performing around the valley at your local comedy clubs. Thank you for watching Best Take. I'm Kyle Watkins. And I'm Matt Burkett. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Tune in again next time for more exciting film and television work from students enrolled at Maricopa Community Colleges.